Okay, today we're going to talk about the bones of the thorax. First, before we do that, I want to mention the hyoid bone. That's this little horseshoe shaped bone here, and it's got two little horns. Looks like little devil horns coming up on it. The hyoid bone uh, sits, it just kind of floats in your neck here. You can see it on this. Or maybe not. <laughs> He's broken. Okay, his, he lost his. Never mind. <laughs> but it sits right here, and your tongue, actually, the base of your tongue, your tongue is skeletal muscle, it attaches to that bone. Remember, skeletal muscle has to have some attachment point to a bone in order to be effective because it's got to pull against something. So that's where your skeletal muscle attaches to the base of that, or your, the base of your tongue attaches to that, and that's what the hyoid bone is. All right. Then you start with the trunk or thorax, and that's going to cover your sternum, your ribs, and your vertebral column. So all of that makes a thorax, and that encases your very important organs in there. Um, notice the organs of, like your heart and your lungs are going to be protected by that uh, bony cage, but down here some of your abdominal organs are going to be not as well protected. But that's the main purpose of these bones up here. So let's go through them. We'll start with the sternum. The sternum is that breastbone right there. Um, it's divided up into three parts. You have the manubrium, you have the body, and then you have the xiphoid or ziphoid process. You can spell it XI or XY. Both of those are acceptable uh, spellings. Uh, this manubrium here, that's um, an anchoring point for your first rib, and then also your clavicle or your collarbone comes and sits right there, and that helps form part of that pectoral girdle that holds your arms on. Um, you can see it on this model right here. The clavicle comes and sits right there at the top of the manubrium on each side, and then you'll have the clavicle attached to your scapula, and that's what holds your arms on. That's that pectoral girdle. All right. Um, just be careful if you ever do CPR. Make sure you're not hitting that xiphoid process. Your, the base of your hand should be up here in the body of the sternum, because if you start doing chest compressions right there, you're going to snap that off and do like my brother who gave my mom the Heimlich Maneuver, and she's 80-something years old, 89, and he broke this and two ribs by just going and that's not how you do it. So just be careful if you ever do that. All right, um, if you look at the ribs, this is just one disarticulated rib. Uh, first of all, you need to know the parts of the rib. The easiest way to do is find this little knobby part on the end of a rib, and that's known as the rib tubercle, okay? then. Above that would be the neck, and then you'd have the head of the rib. So you start with the head, neck, the tubercle of the rib, and then you have the shaft of the rib, and then you have this place down here that's kind of flattened out, and that's where the uh, cartilage attaches right there. So that's uh, called the costal cartilage. Um, it's really the attachment site for the costal cartilages. So if you look at a rib, every rib is basically going to be attached to a vertebra in the back. They all have that attachment point right there. We'll discuss how they attach in a minute. But some of them are going to be attached to the sternum in the front. Some of them are going to be attached to just cartilage. And some of them are just going to be free floating here. Do that so, again, sorry. Okay, some of the ribs are going to be attached all the way from the vertebra all the way around to the sternum. These other ribs down here, they're attached to cartilage, but then that cartilage is attached to other cartilage, and then you have some down here that are just attached to the vertebra. So you call these vertebrosternal ribs. These are vertebrochondral ribs, because chondral means cartilage, and these would just be vertebral ribs. Your book talks about these being as true ribs, these being uh, false ribs, and these being floating ribs. Those terms are not generally acceptable on tests. You want to know them as vertebrosternal vertebrochondral, or just plain vertebral ribs. Um, both males and females have 12 pairs of ribs. Um, you don't have to throw away your belief in the Bible uh, because Adam took, or God took one of Adam's ribs. Just because God took one of Adam's ribs doesn't mean Adam, Adam's kids weren't born with the same amount of ribs, so that, don't let that throw you off. But uh, both males and females have 12 sets of ribs, and all of your ribs are going to be attached to what we call the thoracic vertebra, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So that's where they attach. All right. Um, you also want to know if your rib is a right rib or a left rib. And the way to do that is you always take that rib tubercle, 
and you want that to be pointing down. So that needs to be on the inferior part of your rib. You don't want to set it up like that so that it's sticking up. So you get your rib tubercle pointing down, and then you want to look at your rib at the costal end. You don't want that to be pointing up, because if you look at the model, the ribs are, they're making a downward angle like this. They're, they're doing, well, this is the wrong side. They're making the downward angle like this. They're not going up like that. So your ribs are always going to be pointing down. And so that's how you know if you've got a right or left rib. So we take this, we put the um, rib tubercle pointing down, and then that's how it would attach to the, the uh, vertebra right like, right like that. And then, of course, you want the costal limb pointing down. If you have an intact sacrum, you've got a fusion of five vertebrae here, and then the last four vertebrae form what's called the coccyx, and that's uh, fused together in adults. But in kids, those are going to be separated, and these are not fused together. So children will have 33, and adults have uh, 26 vertebrae. The way you can remember what kind of vertebrae you have, you always think about food. Um, you eat breakfast at 7 a.m., and so you have seven cervical vertebrae, and those are going to be the ones that are in your neck. Then you eat lunch at 12, and so you're going to have 12 thoracic vertebrae. Those are going to be all the ones that have the ribs attached to them. And then if you're a geriatric person, you eat dinner at 5. I don't usually eat dinner until about 9, but um, if you eat dinner late, uh, this won't make sense. But just imagine that you eat dinner at 5, so that tells you you have five lumbar vertebrae. And then, of course, you have your sacrum and your coccyx below that. Let's put a good one up there. So there's your sacrum, and then your little coccyx, that's your uh, tailbone there. All right, well, let's start looking at individual vertebra. And I'm just going to take one and just kind of explain the different parts of it first. Um, the easiest way to learn about a vertebra is to make sure you orient it the way that it goes in your body. And it doesn't take long to figure it out. You have this big part right here called the body, and when you're um, in the womb developing, you're going to have these pedicles come up and they wrap around and they make this kind of an arch here and then there's an opening in it. Well, the opening is going to be for the spinal cord. So if you put a bunch of these vertebrae, if you put them together, you'll see that um, you've got this opening continuing all the way through. So the spinal cord runs through that opening there. That's called the vertebral foramen. Okay, so you have the body and then you have the vertebral foramen and then coming straight up from that you're going to have a process that comes out, and that's known as the dorsal or spinous process. Then you've got some coming um, off of each side, and those are going to be known as your transverse processes. Just think in a transverse plane or a transverse section. So how do you orient this now to figure out the rest of these processes? The way I do it is you always put the body of the vertebra facing your belly. So like I'm sitting here talking to you, this is facing you know, towards the belly, and then the dorsal or spinous process faces towards your back. So you have the body faces the belly, BB, and the dorsal or spinous process is going to uh, face your back. So now that's oriented correctly, but it could be like this. But it, oh, it's not, because what you have to do is you have to look at those transverse uh, processes, and you always want the dorsal or spinous process to fall below the plane of those transverse processes. So like this one, that's going to be the way this is. If you take this one right here, that's wrong. You've got to get it so that the, trans or the uh, spinous process falls below the, the plane of those transverse processes right there. So once you get it oriented correctly with the body in front, the spinous process is in the back, that's how it's going to sit in my body as I'm sitting here talking to you. So then you have your transverse processes here. Well, then you can figure out the rest of the process. You have these two little pinches coming up here. Those are going to be your superior articular processes. And then on the bottom side, you've got two little pinches coming down as well. Those are going to be your inferior articular processes. Well, the reason you have superior and inferior articular processes, these two don't go together, but I can still demonstrate what's going on, is your, the uh, inferior processes of the vertebra on top is going to articulate with the superior processes of the vertebra below it, and that forms another opening right there known as the intervertebral foramen. Think about what the word inter means. It means between. So between vertebral foramen. Foramen is a hole. 
So this intervertebral foramen right here is where your spinal nerves are going to come off of your spinal cord because your spinal cord is going to be running through here and then you have your spinal nerves coming out of there. So that's basically what a vertebral uh, or what all the vertebrae look like. You've got, let me run through it one more time. You've got your body. You see the spinal nerves coming up. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You can see your spinal nerves coming out right there. So if you put another one on top of it like that, that's your spinal cord coming through there and then your spinal nerves are coming out through there. Okay, so that's from the superior articular processes on the bottom, they articulate with the inferior props, articular processes on the top vertebra, and that gives you that little intervertebral foramen right there. Okay, all right, um, let me run through this one more time then. So you have body, spinous process or, or dorsal process, transverse processes, and then if you have it positioned correctly, superior processes on the top, inferior processes on the bottom, vertebral foramen, and then where these processes articulate uh, with the uh, vertebra in front of it, you're going to have this hole right here, which is your intervertebral foramen. And that's it for a single vertebra. So let's start going down from the, uh, down the vertebral column and look at the different types. The first vertebra you have, C1 here, is the cervical vertebra. It's known as the atlas. Atlas was the Greek god that held the world on his shoulders. Well, this atlas is going to hold the, the head, um, and it actually, what happens is you articulate with these, um, if I can get on here right, you articulate with the, the occipital condyles right here and here. They're going to sit in these little um, fossa right here, and that's going to allow your head to do this yes motion, so it rocks it up and down. So this first vertebra, it's a cervical vertebra, is known as the atlas that holds the head and those uh, condyles will sit in those dips right there and that allows the head to rock up and down like that. Your second cervical vertebra, get some that actually look like they belong together, um, your second cervical vertebra here is known as the um, axis. And the reason we call it an axis is because it's got this process known as the dens coming up on it and that makes a pro or provides an axis so that the head can rotate around it. Um, so this second cervical vertebra here is called the axis, and the only thing you need to know about it is this special process here called the dens. And the, reasons, the reason it's called the dens or odontic process is because somebody thought it looked like a tooth. And think about or orthodontist or dentist, that's what that uh, prefix means. So that's the dens of your axis. So you have your atlas, then you have your axis, and so that allows you to have a, a yes motion and you can actually rotate around and get the no motion as well. All of your cervical vertebra, and remember you have seven of them, have what's known as transverse foramina. So if you look at the transverse processes, they all have holes in them for uh, nerves to come out. So you can always recognize a cervical vertebra because the transverse uh, processes will have foramina in them. Um, notice on this first cervical vertebra though, the atlas, there's no body. All of your other ones are going to have a body on them, but this is the only one that doesn't have a body. So that is another way that will help you recognize that first cervical vertebra known as the atlas. And then of course the axis you can recognize easy because it has that dens on top of it. But then all of the other cervical vertebra, you can always recognize those because they have the transverse foramina and that gives them away real quick. Then you have 12 thoracic vertebra, and the thoracic vertebra are 